Most business owners struggle to hit their goals and maybe even run their business into the ground because of one really common mistake. They focus on the stuff that does not matter. And the antidote to that is obviously to make better decisions and pick better things to focus upon. But when I see new business owners chatting and giving advice to each other, I often cringe because the advice and the thought processes and decisions are often really not great. So today I wanted to bring in a fabulous business friend of mine, someone who has built and scaled a million dollar business, Shay from the Bucket List Bombshells. Today, we're gonna chat all about making better decisions, Shay's annual planning process, what helps her make decisions, but what to focus her efforts on for the new year, and a never before shared story on a bad business decision and exactly why it flopped for Shay. If you are excited for the BB's shop of merch, which never launched, Shay spills exactly what happened and it is super interesting. <laughs> Shay, thank you so much for being here. Yay, thank you so much for having me and I can't wait to nerd out over planning and decision making. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Okay, so let's start with, mm -hmm. you have coached literally hundreds, actually maybe even thousands of business owners yeah. and you see the decisions that they make for mm -hmm. their online businesses. What would you say the most common bad decisions are that you see business owners making, which you just wish you could just stop them from making and just save them all the hassle? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So we work with a lot of members at either like the launching or the growing and then a smaller amount at that scaling stage. So the two mistakes I really see are kind of in that initial like launching a business and then growing it. So the first thing that I see with business owners who are launching an online business is that they are not choosing a consistent marketing strategy. And I know this is some uh, something that you talk about as well when it comes to what is the best way to get leads for your new online business. And it's really about choosing one marketing strategy and going all in and really getting to know it and being consistent. Because the biggest area that I see is when we're on TikTok, we're on Instagram Reels, we're on Instagram in general, and we're scrolling and we see, oh, this new strategy, this new trend, this person is making six figures from this. Now this person is making six figures from that. And it's putting the cart before the horse and it's getting, it's creating a lot of anxiety, I find, and a lot of shiny object syndrome. And people are then, I just see them bounce from one strategy to the next. They'll try it for like, less than 30 days and they'll be like, it doesn't work because I didn't get leads or it doesn't work because I didn't get opt-ins or it doesn't work because I didn't get a sales call. And when I actually ask them, we dive into, I'm like, okay, well tell me what you've done. And it's like, okay, you posted one time on Instagram with a freebie with a call to action link, like once a week or something like that. And it's like very minimal. And then they jump to a different strategy and then they're like, well, then I created like a webinar or then I create, then I sent out only five pitch emails or I joined three Facebook groups and commented on posts or I applied for one job on Upwork. And it's, and there's just the volume there when you're starting out, you need a high volume of consistent activity or marketing activity to really create the snowball effect that I promise will happen when it comes to getting leads. Because I think the biggest issue in the launch stage is they're just like, I need my first client. I need my first client. I need my first client, which is absolutely correct. You need your first client and then you need to get referrals from that client and you need to, you know, snowball off that. And they're also taking advice online from people who are at a different stage in business than they are so they when they've launched they're taking growth strategies or they're taking scale strategies and they don't realize that that's they're not at that stage of business yet because I think it's hard to really understand when someone just posts a 90 second reel uh, as to you know what what stage of business they may be speaking to or in and so I think it's really important my advice would be to counteract that in the launch stage is to pick something, whether it's blogging, whether it's cold pitching, whether it is in Facebook groups or on Upwork or whatever the strategy is, um, pick one, get to know it really well, like then go research and find, okay, what are people doing really well with this one strategy? And then be very consistent at a high volume. I'm talking like if you're sending out pitch emails, like I want you sending out like five to seven a day. 
or if you are in Facebook groups, I want you interacting every single day. I want you scouring there, finding leads, posting about your knowledge or experience. And just doing that for like really consistently for 90 days, I bet you will get a for your client and more in that 90 days. That would be my advice for the launch people. Could not agree more. <laughs> Everything you said. It's like, yeah. yeah. So when once we've gotten clients under our belt, we're getting pretty consistently booked out. We've got revenue coming in and we're at that stage where we're wearing too many hats and we can't take on more client work without hiring. And I think that people reach the stage and then they end up hiring way too fast, way too soon with no strategy. They're just like, okay, well, I have all this work. Let me just find a VA to take it all on. Like, doesn't matter what it is. We always throw the poor VAs. I was talking to a VA the other day and she was like, I only do, like, she's like, I do so many things. I only want to do this one area. But she's like, when someone hires me, they expect me to do so much because we have this umbrella term. And I think that's great. And there's lots of personalities out there for that. But I think when we're trying to figure out, and this kind of goes into decision making. So when we're trying to figure out, like, what would be the best um, hiring process for us or, like, what would be the most helpful, you want to look at like your full plate of like everything you're doing and then start to create and kind of bundle them together into similar ish areas. And then what are the areas that you want to be in? So for example, sometimes I have members that they want to be in the doing of actually say executing the work, their graphic design work, their website design work, their social media management. They're like, I still want to actually produce the work for the client, but I really just do not want to have to deal with closing a client, getting leads or doing the customer service side or even the client management side. Great. Hire for those things that you don't want to do. And just hire like one at a time for like, just try out five hours a week, you know, look at your forecast, look at your budgets, make sure you can, you know, have a runway of about six months if you were to work with this person, but just start small. There's hire a contractor. There's no need to hire a social media manager, a VA, a sales assistant, a junior designer, whatever it is. And then on the other side, there's people that they actually don't really want to do the client work anymore, they realize that they're actually just really good at running a business really well. And they'd rather outsource the client side of the work. And they want to do the sales, the marketing, the customer service, the customer experience. And so great, let's start subcontracting out your client work. And this is kind of gets into an agency model. But again, we're not hiring a bunch of junior designers. We're not hiring a bunch of junior VAs. We are just starting with one, start out with a really small amount of hours and just be really clear with your expectations of the deliverables. And that's why the first step in the beginning was write out every nitty gritty thing that is just overwhelming you at this stage. And then you categorize it and then you say, okay, these are the first things I wanna hand off. And then you have this outline And you basically share that with the person you're hiring and saying, these are the expectations I have for you. I want you to manage my inbox. I want you to manage all of the post sales call processes. Here's exactly how I do it. Here's an SOP. Here's my expectations. Feel, you know, bring them in. If they have expertise in this area, great. Get their opinion and advice. But I see a lot of people make the mistake where they go out, they hire these like experts in every single area of these businesses they want, they end up paying crazy amount of money. And then it just doesn't work out because they weren't really clear on what they wanted. And they made this really big investment that then leads to potentially like negative profits or not or investing in something that you didn't really need at that stage in business. I'd say that's kind of the next level is scaling is investing in these coaching or these bigger programs or something like that on that growth sale when the biggest mistake i see is just people going out and just like hiring and not really having any idea what they're actually trying to get off their plate so that would be my advice for that mm-hmm. yeah stage incredible advice okay. yeah. i hear you on that one yep absolutely amazing in terms of i think another thing which i see a lot of business owners do or struggle with is maybe they've got their clients coming in and they're like okay cool They then give themselves 97 projects that they need to Mm do like this month or this year. And so it's like, Mm -hmm. I need to create a new option. I need to create a course. Mm. I need to add a new service. I need to start a new marketing strategy. I need to buy this course or get that coaching program. And they just have so, like they just can't pick 
Mm -hmm. what they should be doing or spending their Mm -hmm. time on. Can you give some advice for when someone's trying to pick like projects or things to be doing? What, like, how do you know how to choose the next way that you should grow this business? Yeah, such a fun question. And I feel like my advice now is just based off of of a lot of trial and error of experience. And the two things that I focus on now and that I encourage especially my members in our mastermind program to to focus on is time freedom and money freedom. So those are kind of like the baselines. So money freedom is obviously having the money that we want personally as our salaries as well as the money that we need to invest into the things that we want to invest in in our business. And then time freedom is basically outside of your business, how do you want to fill your time in your life? You know, most of us want that work-life balance, but we end up not realizing that shiny object syndrome, again, is kind of coming into play when we're thinking about the projects that we want to take on on the next year. And I also want to say that not every year has to be a growth year. And I think that's a really big misconception is that we sit down say at the end of the year and we're mapping out next year and we're thinking well okay i i did this amount or i did have these amount of projects i had this amount of recognition and we look and we say okay well i only have two courses maybe i should add three or i only have or i don't have a coaching program yet and that doesn't always have to be the case but i think it's presented that way i think even in i went to business school even in traditional teachings it was always like you need to grow year over year, that's what a business does. And like, yes, maybe if you have shareholders and you're paying shareholders out, absolutely. I think that that's kind of half, that comes kind of comes with the territory. Like, yes, you need growth. (laughs) But as a small business owner and as um, someone who wants more time and money freedom in their life, something has to give and something we can't always be in a growth year, but it doesn't mean we can't have a growth year. So let's say that we've decided, okay, yes, next year I do wanna bring some of these new projects that are on my heart. We're all passionate, we're all creative, we're visionaries. But sometimes I think we're taking on too much because we're not really evaluating. So I know your question was basically, how do we decide how to evaluate these projects? And so I come back to time and money freedom. So I look at what are the things that I have to do next year? And by have to, I mean, we have a standard amount of services or products on a product ladder that you offer every year. So for example, we offer a mastermind coaching program. It's six months, we offer it twice a year. And now we kind of will evaluate how much time and money in a second that that will bring. And so then we go down the list, okay, well, there's other, you know, is it, what other products and services do you want to bring in next year because those are kind of our baselines right like those are the things that's how we're making money and then you look at okay well i want what worked in the past okay the opt-ins worked really well um, for this offer the marketing strategy worked really well for this offer the sales process worked really well do we need to tweak it now if we want to tweak something or change something or we have some new idea that we're like again shiny object syndrome we saw some other coach doing or some other service-based online entrepreneur doing i want you to ask yourself will it be more time freedom or money freedom or the third one is kind of a caveat is it like something you were so passionate about like you want to bring into this world because it's going to bring you a lot of fulfillment regardless of time and money and so you look at that and you say okay well if I do this marketing strategy it's going to increase my enrollments here and but it's going to take x amount of my time or if it's going to take a team member's time that's uh taking out of your profit so and then it's like less money it's not as much money and then you basically decide do I want using that time using that cost analysis essentially Um, there's no right or wrong answer here, which is kind of annoying. It's kind of like you decide, great, I wanna give up my time for that money and because I want more people in the program so I can serve more people. It's not just about time and money, I'm just making it really simplified. So that's kind of how I start making decisions and I apply that process to each uh, in the areas I would say of like marketing, sales. So when it comes to new products and services, there's a third variable that is, is this product or service going to be super fulfilling to me and I'm willing to give up either it's going to break even or it's only going to make a small amount of profits and I'm okay with that because I really just want to bring this project into the world and it's going to fulfill me on a deeper level great you're also probably giving up your time in that sense as well but you are 
because it's a passion. So it's not really like, it's not a negative. Time and money, um, giving up time or money is not a negative thing. It's a choice, it's a decision. Now we do need to evaluate your capacity. And that's where you then decide, well, if I wanna bring this passion project in, that means that I might not be able to do new marketing strategies or increase enrollments for this product or service or increase sales or leads here. Then you start to evaluate all of the projects as a whole. And that's how you sort of ample look at, at your year and you be realistic. You start to understand how many projects can you take on per month and that equals out to the year. So that's when you really need to look at your capacity for like, there really is only an X amount of time in a day that you can get stuff done. And that's kind of like the third layer when it comes to new products and services. I want, I don't want you just evaluating it off of time and money. I do want you to think about it, how is this going to serve the people in my community? Is this going to be something that's really fulfilling to me? Is this something that I just feel called to bring in? Great. Make room. But that means saying yes to one thing is saying no to another thing. So there's only an X amount of time. And if you still want to maintain a really high volume of time freedom outside your business, that means that this fulfillment project, this new product or service is going to have to replace something that you already are doing or you or replace the amount of time or money you will spend amplifying something else. So it's just kind of evaluating like that. And I wish I had more of a visual example. So I hope that was easy to follow when it comes to like how I make decisions. And the last thing that I do want to say to this, and then I will um, wrap up my response is that not everything that you want to bring into this world is needs to be monetized and needs to be in your business. So this is something that I had to learn. And I see this happen a lot with members when I'm coaching them is that when we're as passionate and we're good at selling and we're good at like serving in the online space as entrepreneurs, every single new skill or passion that we develop, we immediately try to monetize. It's like, it's crazy to me. I was like, I was learning how to like digitally illustrate for fun, for no reason at all. And then all of a sudden I was like, I need to monetize this. You're learning these new skills for fun or you take a course for fun or you like, you know, have been doing a lot more like fitness stuff. I'm like, should I become like a fitness influencer? And it's like, no. <laughs> Just because you are skilled at something, passionate about something, enjoy something, um, have a new, especially someone like me, have such a thirst for knowledge, you don't have to monetize everything. Some things can just be for you. They can be a hobby. They can be something that you do for that pure enjoyment, fulfillment, and then you give to friends and family. You know, I can make my candles, I give them to friends and family. Or because once you start monetizing something, it becomes a job and it can, and not that it loses that freedom or fulfillment because I feel like a lot of us online entrepreneurs, especially women, we do work that's very fulfilling, but it adds that extra layer onto like the, okay, well now I need to forecast out how many of these candles can I sell? How many of these digital prints can I sell? What is the marketing strategy? And these things are two things that are completely different from what I currently do. And that's fine, but then evaluate, like, is it, is that really where you want to spend your time and will does that extra income really make that big of an impact on your overall lifestyle and way of life because usually you can just simply double down on marketing and sales in your current service offering to make whatever it is if it's like a financial uh thing that you want from this hobby to make those extra finances and not at something that you already have an audience for so that was the last thing i wanted to say is like we don't always have to monetize every single skill we have Oh my gosh, yes. And I think that because a lot of online entrepreneurs were personal brands. And so we're like, mm -hmm. well, I'm a personal exactly. brand. I can like add whatever. And like, because I like it, it's part of the brand. Exactly. And it is, so I've like dabbled in other things and I have learned some hard lessons that it's very, it's a long, hard road to be known for one thing mm -hmm. to then become known for another thing. And I was chatting to a mastermind friend the other day and she was saying, I don't know, she had heard from in, I don't know, I think she actually went to business school. I did not, you did it, I guess. Um, <laughs> they said like, you can't, you can't try Same. to do a new offer okay. to a new audience. Like that Got is it. when things just flop. Mm. So it's like, you can do a new offer to your same people, or you could do the same offer to different people, but trying to do the new offer and the new people is when things just do not really mm. go super well. And I thought that was very interesting. Um, well, I was going to say, just to your point of like a personal brand, I think that that's 
really where it comes into when it's like, well, we're, it's us. We're the face technically of this brand. People buy from us because they like, know, trust us and our knowledge and our experience and our personality. And I think that it got to a place where I was trying to, I wanted to try to monetize every aspect of who I am as a person. And that just became really stressful and something I didn't want to do, which it, as anyone who's followed Buckless Bombshells knows, we we haven't monetized any of those aspects. This is a very much behind the scenes thing that I think I've struggled, I struggled with for a long time. Whenever I learned a new skill, I thought, well, I should bring, I should now be an expert in this skill because we're a personal brand. We can put anything under the umbrella of this company. I think that's so interesting that you say that because yeah, people don't realize that you actually had all of those zillion ideas, yeah. which then you decided to not bring forward. Yeah. And It can really confuse your people when you have like 20 million different products or different arms of the things. Like Mm -hmm. it's not not great. It's really, I love also what you said about like, it could literally be easier to make more money just doing more of the thing you're already doing. Like that could be, is pretty almost guaranteed significantly easier than launching something new. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah. Or converting a lot of the stuff we do with our mastermind members is converting your current Uh, or past clients, like people who have already purchased from you, it is so much easier. There's a stat with a certain conversion, but it's so much easier to convert and increase the lifetime value of a customer than it is to go out and find a new one or like, or create a new product and service and launch it. It's for the same audience, but it's also for an audience that it's like a second layer that they've already purchased from us. So they already have been a customer. And so like, yeah. that's really the sweet spot too, when you're evaluating. That is the sweet spot. Yeah. They're like ascending ladder yes. basically. Totally. Yeah. Amazing. All right. Good. Um, okay. I want to hear about you personally. So okay. new year's <laughs> coming. You are planning for the new year. Uh huh. What questions are there questions you ask mm. yourself? What does it look like? Do you go to a certain place? Like yeah. describe to me your whole like new year's planning system and what things you're thinking about as you're doing it. Yeah, this one's so fun because um, for those of you who don't know, I have a business partner and um, her name is Cassie and she is the other half of the Buckleist Bombshells. And so what's really fun is that we like to do retreats when we p- go and plan for the new year or really anytime we're doing a new idea for products and services, for marketing, for anything that we're changing inside the business. And Cassie was actually just here. I'm on Vancouver Island and she was, well, not just it's but in the summer as like time is flying by she was here in the summer and it was so fun because we were doing that again and sort of looking and reevaluating things and we had a little retreat and so what we do is we kind of have these founders quarterly retreats and we've done these for years so even when we lived in bali when we lived in mexico when we were in the states when we were over in europe we always regardless of where we were actually living, which it's like, okay, we're already technically living in this beautiful place. We usually have beautiful space. We were like, no, we need to go and book like a hotel getaway. But I think what is really um, key is that we shake up our environment and we kind of get out of like, we're not in our home office or we're not in the co-working space or we're not the cafe that we are doing our kind of regular day-to-day work. We are shaking up the environment. And I think as visionaries, as as um, creatives, as, uh, with a lot of ideas, it's just fun to have that environment so if you can not everybody can but if you could book like especially getting out of your kind of day-to-day routine or if you're balancing family just having some like space and time to yourself to really allow you to ideate is something that i highly recommend if it's possible for you to do if not i do just recommend maybe going somewhere different for the day but first we start with a reflection so we're looking at what worked really well this year what maybe didn't work so well and then we secondarily say well do we want to continue doing this um no or if we do we feel strongly oh we want to continue this strategy or offering this product and service um but it was it was kind of like not maybe not working alignment is probably the better way of saying it you're just like i'm not passionate about doing this anymore so if you are not passionate about it or you are not really present with um a marketing strategy a product and service a a back-end experience your team managing your team whatever it is if you're not like engaged aligned and in it like it's just going to come across flat no matter if it's an external business thing or an internal business thing 
it, just let it go. It's okay. It's okay if you had spent so much, I had to give myself so much grace in this area. You spent so much time on a project or on a certain system and process or on something and then you just are like, this isn't working and it's not really, it's just a more of a feeling that's not working. It's okay to let it go and don't berate yourself. It's, it's like sunk costs already in a sense. It's just, it's what's done is done. So each of our projects have a couple different phases. So the first one is idea phase where it's just an idea, it's a concept, it's a thing, it's probably in a Google Doc somewhere. And then it moves into a, um, so you, idea phase into uh, concepting phase or brainstorming phase, I guess, where we're like more outlining it. I have a name. I can't remember the name off the top of my head. But it goes into that phase where we're actually like outlining it. We're saying like, yes, we want to work on this. Learning phase. This is where I'm like... Uh, researching tech platforms, Cass is doing marketing strategy, sales, the front end stuff, I'm thinking about back end stuff, whatever it is, it's like the learning phase. It's like, what do I not know about how either to make improvements on this thing I wanna bring forward, or if it's a new thing, what what do I need to learn? Cause that's just, that's our first place, at least for me, for sure. It's a, such a nerd. I'm like, I gotta know everything at my perfectionism. It moves into like a creation phase where you're actually taking everything that you learned and you're creating the thing, whether it's creating content, whether it's creating the system map, the funnel map, whether it's creating a job description or role. And then we're in execution phase. And so then we're executing all of those things. We're in like the doing, you know, you're, you're putting it out there. You're making it or you're doing it. It's out there. It's in the world. And um, you're implementing, essentially. And then we go into evaluation phase. So whatever metrics or qualitative or quantitative you've put around it, you start to track that and then you evaluate it. For us, we evaluate things on a quarterly basis and then make improvements or like I said, stop doing it or it's working really well and we amplify that. So kind of going back to the other thing, if it's working really well, you wanna bring forward, we wanna amplify it. So that's really how we structure our projects and how we make decisions about bringing things uh, forward or not. And so when it comes to going back to the year and annual, because I got kind of nitty gritty there, the year annual overview is we're looking at uh, each quarter and how many projects our capacity between the two of us and our team can handle. And then we're looking at what is the money this is bringing in, the revenue uh, expenses and profits. And we're like, great, awesome, love this. Or we have different financial goals and we haven't hit them yet based off of you know forecasting. And then the second one is the time freedom. It's like, okay, well, how much time do we have outside the business um, for ourselves, for our friends, families, passion projects, that kind of thing? Are we feeling good about our balance there? If not, then we do evaluate the workload or we start rehire or we um, delegate or we make those decisions there or we make a decision to not bring a project in. So maybe this year is not the year that that project gets implemented and released. We then we just go quarter by quarter and then we have our quarterly founders meetings to kind of keep us on track and make decisions from there. That sounds very fancy. <laughs> um, you Phase names, which I do not have. Like I have the same system, but without the like fancy. Like I'm in this phase now. Oh yeah, it's, it's, it's more of like a project. I do project management side, and so I'm like, I need my team to also know what phase they're at. And it's like I can picture them in like Airtable and Asana. So I'm like, it's like definitely how my brain works. It's like I think some of my creatives on the team would be like, that's not how we think. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Okay. One question, which you, something which yeah. arose for me. Yeah. You mentioned we like figure out like profit and expenses mm -hmm. and revenue and all these things. Can you talk about if someone's launching something for the first time or when you're launching something for the first time, mm -hmm. like how do people, if someone's like, I'm launching for something, mm -hmm. how am I supposed to know how much this yeah. money this thing's going to make? Can you talk about like, have you gone through that and what do you kind of do in that situation? Yeah, such a great question. So I think that going into my learning phase, what I would want to know is um, based off whatever the product and service is, what is the industry standard conversion rate for that? Mm -hmm. So for example, if you are service-based, um, what I see in that world is a 50 to 95% sales call conversion rate. Okay, so if you're launching a new high ticket offer, let's try and aim for that. Then you would need to work backwards on basically how many sales calls would you take and you kind of do good, better, best goals. So like the good would be the 50% conversion. Let's say 75% conversion is better. 95% conversion is the best. What is the price point of your service? 
And then um, how basically working backwards, how many leads do you need to get on a call to hit that conversion rate to get the amount of people booked into your service? You do have to know that when you launch something new, that it you are now figuring out where you fit into the industry, where your product and services meet the needs. Maybe you don't have a big enough audience just yet, or maybe you don't have the right marketing messaging just yet. I always look at, well, what is kind of, and there's lots of blog articles. I just use Google or I use my, mm-hmm. now I, I use my own like industry. I would reach out to my network of people in the same industry and that's, and find out what those conversion rates are. So for example, in the course world, when we were mm-hmm. getting started, the industry average was like two to 2.5% is what our mentors were saying is like what you should aim for. And then now I would reach out because I have so many people in the course world. I've been in masterminds with course creators. Like I could easily now reach out to my network and I have, and like that conversion rate is actually like across the board, like so vastly different. And so when you're launching something new, you want to probably skew on the like lower end of that Mm -hmm. for a course, depending on like your like, no trust factor. So for example, if you were a coach, for many, many years or a service-based business owner for many, many years, and you have the like, no trust factor. And going back to what we were saying, we're creating a product and service for our audience, not a new audience for our current audience. Then maybe you could, you know, hit that industry standard or be above it, or you can kind of give yourself good, better, best goals, knowing you already have an audience built in. If you are brand new, either launching a service or launching a digital product, and you are currently building up your list, building up your like, no trust factor. Even if you have a ton of followers on Instagram and think that you have like, no trust factor, you will be, you will not actually know if you have like, no trust factor until you launch a course. Trust me, I have seen people launch and expect extremely high results and get very little results. And I have seen the opposite of people being like, I have no idea. I just have this really amazing free content platform that I've been so passionate about. Let me try and monetize it. They do and it goes super well. Give yourself a lot of grace and know that like the, you are taking an industry average, that's where I start. And then once you do your own launch, then I just start using my own conversions. And I say, this is my conversion rate. I wanna improve it. Let me understand my audience on a deeper level. And like, I don't really care about the industry standards anymore. I am trying to just improve my launch over my other launch. You base it off your own numbers. There are lots of people in my industry that do way higher conversion rates than me. And I just don't let that get to me. I'm I'm like, I'm staying in my own lane. I'm serving my audience and who wants to buy from me will buy from me. And I'm happy with that and feeling good about my marketing messaging and my strategy and my courses. And you're doing very well with it. So yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. I want to get to the juicy bit. Mm -hmm. And that is... Can you tell me about a bad decision that you made in your business related to like picking some sort of new idea or new project? What did not, what were you like, maybe shouldn't have made that one? Yeah. Realize that you're not a good choice. Yeah, I'm not. Okay, so this is going to sound super cliche, but I don't really have any projects that I feel like were a bad decision. Um, the, the one I want to talk about didn't come to fruition. I think it was because of the pandemic specifically and other reasons where basically I didn't evaluate it. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily want to consider this project a mistake because it was a really fun project. We didn't evaluate it the way that I now, now have an evaluation system for a project. And so that's what I want to share here. Because also, if you are in the BB community, you are probably curious about why we did not launch the BB shop, <laughs> which was going to be lines uh clothing that had like our logo on it or different like cute sayings like t-shirts and hats and i have like so many in my closet right now of all the samples um sweaters i I know (laughs) everyone still does and i I, and then something that again this is evaluating like i would just do it now for swag for fun for giving it away and maybe Mm. maybe putting it on the site and saying you know not really it'd be a it'd be a full passion project because it was such a different Mm. industry it was a physical product there was such a high learning curve and we spent months like half a year developing it 
And we were super passionate about it. We did a photo shoot in Vancouver. It was um, made for our audience. So that wasn't the issue. Our audience had, we, we did a survey. We had them, I think, uh, do something fun with us on like picking designs. This was in 2019. We started developing it. And we we were developing it for our audience. So that felt good. But then the learning curve was so high and it was taking our time away. We didn't evaluate it from that perspective. It was taking a lot of our time away, like doing more launches maybe and, and being able to serve more people in our courses. Um, so we, we kind of put off launches and we put a lot of work onto our plate, on our team's plate. Um, and so it definitely became like our capacity was very maxed out during this time. Because once mm-hmm. we actually got, we just, we had the idea, we thought this is going to be great. We pitched it to our audience. They were like, yes, we want that. <laughs> and I still, every time I wear that, hat I know people still want it and it's not an idea that is it's shelved for right now so to speak and like what could be something that we bring back at the right timing so I think at that time in 2019 there was I can't remember exactly what other thing but there was like a bunch of projects we were doing so we were our team and ourselves were fully maxed out and I think with the learning curve of it all and no forecasting on the money side So it was like time and money were not evaluated on this project. And that's where I've learned my lesson to really be able to see a project through to fruition. We weren't going to lose money necessarily on it, but it wasn't going to be as profitable. So adding a significant amount of revenue. So we just sort of bypassed that and we said, that's fine. We're just going to do it because we really want to create these, you know, swag stuff for our audience and our costs will be covered. So it's fine. But then the shipping side of thing got really complicated. And so we're like, okay, well, originally we we're going to launch it to all of the 60 plus countries that we have students in. And so then we had to reevaluate and be like, like, well, there was like t- certain tax laws and there was shipping and anybody who's done an e-commerce store, I'm sure knows so much more about this. And it's not, um, it's not unachievable. We're smart people. Their businesses have done it before. It's not like it's a model. that's like, oh, this is so new. It was more that because it was a passion project, we, Cass and I personally were taking on pretty much the full workload of the project. Um, we had team members help us, but because they were already maxed on our regular projects, this again is where I didn't really evaluate it. We were taking on the the brunt of the work um, in terms, and like we were getting maxed out and this learning phase was starting to really hit me anyways, because I ran into these things. So we're like, okay, we're just going to launch it to the states because that's where our business is registered so we already have our business set up in the way that it will be fine Mm -hmm. and then you have to decide though from a marketing perspective do you do free shipping or do you make people pay for shipping so that's like a whole thing that was like there's so many different opinions on this strategy and we were like but then your costs are very variable um so then you're we were like well then okay well hawaii we can't (laughs) offer it to hawaii because like the shipping cost is too high that it's like or we'd have to at that point then it's like okay well then you decide and i think that e-commerce make decisions like this you decide okay well that's fine i might not make a profit off of those sales but like something else will balance it out over here but again this was so new to us this was all learning new marketing kind of going back to what we're talking about before this is like it was to our same audience but it was such it was so outside of our realm. Like we'd only ever offered remote digital services. So it was like so new. So we did bring it to almost life. We did have the photo shoot here in Vancouver. For those listening, if you were there at the photo shoot, some of our amazing students came and joined us for that. We had a meetup. It was so fun. We were ready to go. Um, we had made all the decisions and the pandemic hit. <laughs> And the fulfillment center that was going to produce our clothing shut down. (laughs) So, and then it became mode of just everything had shifted in the pandemic. It was, how do we take care of our audience? How do we take care of our family? How do we take care of ourselves? You know, where, what, what is the future of our business? Like it, the physical product, because it was so new to us in in the amount of time and free money freedom that we were starting to lack when it came to that one was that we just we had to shelve it it wasn't the pandemic made it mm-hmm. not a priority anymore and we sh- switched gears into the things that were a priority while i do think people who follow us on instagram and haven't purchased from us would like these products they're more so when we do our research they're really more targeted to our current 
members of people who have purchased a product or service from us. And so I think to reevaluate this passion project, I think that we would bring it back in the capacity of we would factor in the cost of it into our products and services and like maybe offer it as a as a bonus or something. That'd be the most <laughs> popular bonus. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, or like giveaways, like yeah. anytime that you want to get people to do something like, hey, whatever, draw for this yeah. sweatshirt, people will go bananas. Yeah. Because also it's like so exclusive because basically right. just the two of you have them. Yeah. So <laughs> Yeah, and exactly. And that's where you have to like, it's okay. Like it just, it didn't work with the timing, but I feel like it was a blessing in disguise because it was just such a different industry. Like we were, I don't think ready to bring it and because I think everything happens for a reason. Like I don't think it was meant to come into this world at that time, but that doesn't mean that that idea can't be brought back, you know, like, or it can't come into fruition at some other time. So if you're like, it is something that I think is really cool and could be a really fun part of our brand. And if we did it more like giveaways or swag or a small, like now there's so many more tools and stuff also since the pandemic for e-commerce. Um, if we figured you know, we learned a lot, we could totally, we were about to, we could totally implement an e-commerce side. So we could do it. And I think that's just really fun. And that's something that it's always on a list. It's like, okay, we're at our annual planning or we're at our quarterly planning. We have our idea phase items and we're like, which ones do we want to bring into the learning creation execution phase? Mm -hmm. Love that. Yeah. Shay, this was so interesting. <laughs> Honestly, thank you so much. Yeah. I think your insights on decision making and mistakes and lessons are so extremely valuable. And yeah, I think people will be very well served to, um, Go by your processes because they have definitely served you very well. So thank you so much for coming and sharing. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And if anybody wants to get in touch, you can always find me on Instagram at bucketlistbombshells.com. Or if you're at this stage of scaling your business and want to be coached by Cassie and me, you can join us and sign up for the wait list for our mastermind. It's called the Scale with Purpose Mastermind Program. It runs twice a year. And you can find that at bucketlistbombshells.com com slash mastermind yes they take care of you so well in that mastermind i could say and yes. one of my past students just joined it so it is really wonderful so definitely do go consider that we'll put all the links to everything you mentioned below this video so perfect yeah. yes Thank we you. were um happy and um an honor to have Paige as one of our guest experts inside of our mastermind at the beginning of this year and our members who rejoined still rave uh about that workshop that you did and still talk about you with such high regard so i love Love that you were able to come join us in there too yeah there was some brutal honesty in that one <laughs> so those, those bunch of mastermind members got some stuff which has never been shared on the internet before <laughs> <laughs> i love it <laughs> yeah <laughs> Wishing you had your own uber successful business friend like Shay to learn from? Well, I can't go make you a business friend. I can do this for you. Watch this video next to learn the major lessons I picked up from being in a mastermind with 50 incredibly successful millionaire female business owners.